Amen. Well, welcome back. It's good to be back with you all after a couple of weeks away. Thank you, Eric, for doing such an admirable job. I hope you got the water issue straightened out. Where are you, Eric? Did you skip out this week after? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. He's in the nursery. He's too old for the nursery. So it was a good week. The first week uh, that we were away, we had general counsel, as Dwight mentioned, and uh, hopefully you've seen some of the recaps of that. And last week, we just sat by the pool, which was a a wonderful thing. As I left for vacation and uh, was thinking through what I was going to cover when we came back, I had in mind two weeks on this idea of biblical manhood and womanhood, things that I had covered at the Ignite Retreat uh, a few months ago. But as I was uh, resting by the pool and watching my kids splash around, the Lord began to work in my heart a little bit, and I, I sort of felt like he was saying, you know, in light of all of the stuff going on in our culture today, in light of the, uh, the decision the Supreme Court is going to be making in the next few weeks, in light of the, the Bruce Jenner thing, uh, in light of just where we are as a, as a nation, as a culture, I really felt like the Lord was saying, we need to make sure that we are well positioned to fight these battles. Here at Front Range Alliance Church, we need to make sure that as the enemy has drawn his lines and as he's attacking us in this uh, front here, we need to, be, have, we need to have our, our armor uh, polished up and strong and sturdy. We need to have the weapons uh, prepared and we need to, to fight well, so to speak, and to handle these things in a biblical way. So uh, we're going to do six weeks on, uh, on this. It, well, biblical manhood and womanhood is not exactly the right uh, way to describe it. The title that uh, we're giving this is Male and female, he created them. I think I jumped the gun or they jumped the gun or something, but uh, male and female, he created them. So that's what we're going to look at over the next uh, six weeks. Actually, there'll be a break in there for a missions uh, Sunday as well. As we jump into this topic, uh, I believe there are two extremes that we need to be careful of. We need to, to watch out that we don't fall off either side of this horse. On one hand, we need to be careful not to be cantankerous to use a good $7 word. Some of you can look that up on your phone if you want. We need, to be, we need to be careful not to be harsh and unloving and unkind. We need to remember to be gracious and gentle and peaceful as we hold to biblical convictions on these things. One of the things that I need to constantly remind myself of is that when people sin, no matter what the sin is, When people sin, the most offended party is always God. Unless they are sinning against me, I'm not offended at all. It's not my law that anybody is breaking. It's not my tradition that matters. Frankly, American culture, tradition is irrelevant in these discussions. It doesn't matter if culture changes ultimately. That's not our standard, what has always been done before. That's not where we stand firm. And it's not your laws that anybody is breaking. You're not the one offended by decisions that are made in our culture. It's God's laws. It's God's concerns. It's what he has determined is right and wrong. That is always what we should stand for. And so as we engage with people who are going down paths that are offensive to God, we must speak to them as those who recognize our job is to love them and try to rescue them from the judgment that they will find at the hand of God. They're not under our judgment. No one is ever going to stand before me and give an account for their decisions. And they're not going to stand before you and give an account. They're going to stand before God. And so as we approach these things, we need to be loving and gentle and gracious. Love is our duty. But the other side of the horse that we sometimes are tempted to fall off of, fall off that way, is Defining love as compromise and acceptance. We must be very careful not to let love equal compromise or acceptance. I was reading an article in Christianity Today earlier this week, and there was a a woman who was describing how her brother has now decided to be her sister. And as I was reading through the article, I couldn't help but see at least a pull on her toward accepting him 
and struggling with what to do about it. And she quoted John 8, as, as is uh, pretty common these days, the woman caught in adultery, and where Jesus said to her, go and sin no more, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And she was really camping on the neither do I condemn you part, which that's what I was just saying. It's not, it's, we're not the ones who condemn anybody. But as she was wrestling with the uh, go and sin no more, she was hesitating. She was struggling with whether or not she could actually say that to him. And where it sounded like she was going, and I don't know this person, and I may be misreading her, but where it sounded like she was going was that she's just going to accept him. Not just love him in spite of his sin, but accept him in his sin. We must never do that. There is a great temptation when we talk about loving people, loving sinners. There's a great temptation to minimize sin, to to start believing and thinking that sin is no big deal. Friends, there is no way we can look at the cross and say that sin is no big deal. The son of the living God came to this earth and he took on flesh and he allowed evil, wicked men to drive spikes through his hands and through his legs and stick a spear in his side and a crown of thorns in his head and mock him and ridicule him. And he hung there suffocating, naked in humiliation for hours. And that's just the physical pain. When you think of the dark clouds rolling in and the Old Testament darkness signified judgment and that middle of the day when the sun is at high noon and it's dark, what's happening there is God Almighty is pouring out his unmitigated wrath on Jesus. He experienced in those few hours an eternity's worth of hell. We never can think of those things and look at the cross and somehow say, sin is no big deal. Tell that to Jesus. No, sin is no big deal, then I don't need to go down there and pay the price for you. Sin is a very big deal. And we don't honor Christ faithfully by reducing and minimize the significance and the seriousness of disobeying God's laws. And so as we wrestle with these things, as we think through these things, we need to keep those two things in the right perspective. We need to love people, be gracious with them, seek their restoration with God. Show them whatever sin you have committed, whatever sin this is, it's pardonable, it's forgivable. At the same time, let them know that the consequences are serious of what they're doing. So unless you've been living under a rock, and even if you have been living under a rock, you've probably seen all the stuff going on, you know what's going on, and and you have liberals and conservatives back and forth and back and forth, and and the fighting going on, then they drag the Christians into this, and we're all bigots and hate mongers and and all this, right? And as the battle rages and all the fighting goes on, all the name calling goes on, you know who is sitting back with a huge smile on his face? Satan. He loves this because he's the one behind it all. He's the instigator of all of it. Do you, Christian, realize how much Satan hates you? He hates you with a passion. In the book of Revelation, One of the most graphic passages that deals with this, we see that Satan's described as this dragon. And he's trying to kill Jesus in the the vision. And it's 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 a grotesque image. He, this dragon, is standing there with the the woman in childbirth getting ready to give birth to Jesus, and he's standing there like at the stirrups, ready to catch the baby. So he can kill it. It's a really graphic image. But the baby escapes. So then the dragon turns his vengeance on the church. We see this in chapter 12. So the dragon was enraged 
with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. He's enraged. He's furious. Earlier it said he knew his time was short and he's making war. Now, I know you know this, but don't let the significance of that phrase escape you. He's making war with you. He has declared war on you, against you. In war, you're not just trying to injure somebody. You're not trying to cause them some mild discomfort. You want to take them out. And that's exactly what he wants to do with us. He's described there as a dragon. Now, in all the good books... Dragons are fierce. You can't train them. In all the good books, dragons breathe fire and consume hundreds of their foes in one swoop. And they have this impenetrable scale. You can't kill them except if you have the black dart, right? That's a good book. They're one of the most ominous, threatening, fearful creatures in all of mythology and fantasy. That may not be the dragon that uh, John sees, though. In the Old Testament, the dragon, the word that we get dragon from, is the sea monster, Leviathan, killer whale on steroids. This, this monster, you still don't want to meet up with this monster. Even if it's not flying and breathing fire, you don't want to encounter this creature. It'll take you out. And then, of course, there's the Apostle Peter who describes Satan as a lion. Not just any lion, but a hungry lion, roaring lion. Now, really, if you went walking out in the hills here and you came face to face with a lion, what would you do? Now, I'm not talking about the lions that have been doped up and locked in a cage down in the zoo for years. I mean, you're out in the wild, and it's a lion. I wouldn't want to meet one of those either, frankly. But they are terrifying creatures. There's a reason why we call them the king of the jungle. Much larger creatures are afraid of the lion. So take your pick, whether you want the fire-breathing flying monster or the killer whale, the leviathan, or a roaring lion, Satan is a foe that we do not want to meet up with. And he is against us, and he is making war against us, and he hates us. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesians, told the church there to put on their armor, to stand firm in their armor, to get their armor ready. And he says something that we must not forget. He said this in chapter 6. Our struggle... Our battle, our war, it's not against flesh and blood. MSNBC is not the enemy. Liberal governments, they're not the ultimate enemy. ISIS is not the ultimate enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but the one who stands behind our enemies. Rulers powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. He is the one behind everything that is against the church. And he is so excited and so happy to see the culture heading the way it is and to work up our fellow Americans against us in opposition and persecution. And he loves what's going on. He's behind what's going on in other parts of the world where Christians are being systematically executed. And he just smiles and he laughs. He thinks he's winning the war. His strategy is to kill us, to destroy us. How does he do it? What's his technique? One of his chief techniques is deception. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. And he wants to disrupt God's purposes and plans and fool us, pull the wool over our eyes, as it were. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, said that Satan 
presents himself as an angel of light. Did, we, did I give you that one, John? Describing false apostles who appear to be godly, but they're not. They're false apostles. And he says, no wonder that there are false apostles disguising themselves as true apostles, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. He wants to deceive. He shows up and says, hey, I'm one of you. I'm one of the good guys. Follow me. I mean, if he just showed up and said, hey, I'm the devil trying to kill you, he wouldn't get very far with the Christians, at least. But he shows up as an angel of light trying to deceive us. Jesus said this about him. He said, you, speaking to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. What, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan loves to lie, he loves to deceive, he loves to trick, he loves to fool, and he's been doing it from the beginning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. I had another joke about Eric, but he's not even here, so I'll skip it. Didn't he say he was going to cover the first three books of the Bible last week? Called himself the anti-Doug? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for him this morning, but he's not here, so I'll have to skip on. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Can you hear the music? Can you hear the soundtrack behind those words? It's ominous. It's dark. It's sinister as the serpent slithers his way toward the woman here. You can just feel it. Something very, very, very bad is about to happen. It says he was more crafty, more cunning, some of your translations may see. The word itself simply means wise. But when used in a negative context, crafty, cunning, clever, they all fit. What this means is Satan is not only a liar, he's a really good one. He's not only a deceiver, he's a really talented one. When it comes to deception, he's the best. He's smart. He knows how to make it happen. He's crafty. The word crafty itself, the idea of craft, we had this discussion with my kids on the way in this morning. We were, we were talking about this. What does crafty mean? Well, crafts are things that you make, right? You have to have skill. You have to have an art ability, an artist's ability. That's where the word comes from. Crafty is a skill. He's made an art form of deception and lies. So he shows up to the woman, and he says to her, just an innocent question, seemingly. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Seems like a pretty innocent question. Just checking my facts here, Eve. Did, did God really say this? But he's cunning, remember? He's crafty. He's not asking an innocent question. There are no innocent questions from, from snakes. What's he doing? Why is he asked that? Did you notice how he framed it? Eve, did God say you may not eat of any tree of the garden? Hmm. Put yourself in Eve's, I was going to say shoes, but she didn't wear shoes yet. Put yourself in Eve's place. Hmm. Is that what God said? Any tree of the garden? No, that, that, that's not what he said, is it? Are we not supposed to eat of any tree? Hey, Adam, what was that you told me? Are we, not, are we not allowed to eat of any tree? Wow, what would that be like if we couldn't eat of any tree? Huh. 
No, no, she says. She said, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Now, according to our record, according to what we have in the scripture, God didn't say anything about touching it. Now, it's possible that Adam got it wrong. He was the one who heard the the message from God, right? But here's what I think is going on here. I think the, the snake, serpent, Satan, has already put in Eve's mind, he's, he's tricking her, he's deceiving her into thinking, Eve, if you are not allowed to eat of any tree that you want to, if there's even one tree that you can't eat from, God may as well have forbidden you to eat from all of them. Because you are not in control, Eve. You're not the captain of your own ship. You don't get to decide what you do and don't do. He's put restrictions on you. He's put constraints on you, Eve. And she's thinking about it. And she's wondering what God meant and why God restricted that one. And now she's sort of feeling the weight of God's severity. He said, we'll die if we do this. We shouldn't even touch it. God is maybe an oppressive God. I don't know. That's what it sounds like to me. So then the serpent dismisses with the whole cunning and trickery here, and he goes straight to a contradiction against what God has said. The serpent says to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, Your eyes will be opened. You will be enlightened, Eve. You will be like God, knowing, recognizing good and evil. Do you realize what just happened there? Direct contradiction, and what the serpent said to the woman is, you can't trust God. He's the deceiver. He knows, Eve, if you eat of that tree, you are going to take the reins of your life for yourself, and he won't be able to control you anymore. You're going to be like him. You're going to decide what's good and what's evil. You're going, you are going to be the captain of your own boat, and he's afraid he's going to lose control. He's the liar, Eve. He's the one you can't trust. Notice what he didn't do. He did not show up and say, Eve, you follow me or you follow God. Which one of us are you going to follow? That wasn't the trick. He would never win that battle. He's a snake. Snakes can't compete with God. I mean, even if he's got, he's on his back legs or something, like apparently he was. He's standing up tall. Yeah, how impressive is that? Okay, it's a snake rising up compared to God. Not very impressive, right? But if he gets her to choose between God and her own desires, now he can get somewhere. Eve, you need to choose between what God has said and your own control of your life. What does she do with this? Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Different kind of music should be playing now. I think Satan took Eve to two conclusions. Number one, God's laws are oppressive. They are oppressive. He's overbearing. He's harsh. He's squashing your freedom, Eve. 
Number two, there aren't any consequences to your choices. Is that not where we are today in our culture? God's laws are oppressive. And do whatever you want, there are no consequences. Think of the first one first. God's laws are oppressive. Now, they don't come right out and say God's laws are oppressive. There's been a a transition, this deception that Satan has been leading America through. He's he's crafty. Crafty. Because for, for, since the inception of America, we've sort of done a hat tip to biblical morality. And we've never been a Christian nation. We've never had biblical law as American law, per se. But as D.A. Carson likes to say, even though there have always been atheists, up until recently, they were always Christian atheists. The God they didn't believe in was the Christian God. Right? That, that's just that's what everybody assumed was if there's a standard of morality in America, it's the, it's the biblical one. And, and so to go down some of these paths that we've gone down recently, you couldn't get there in years past and just come right out and say God's laws are oppressive. Because the general populace would have said no. Even those who didn't follow God's laws would have said no, 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 those are the right laws. And so it's had to go slowly and carefully and systematically. But in the last 40 years or 50 years, all that's gone away. And so now, Christians who hold to the Scripture either are being forced to reinterpret the Scripture and abandon what it seems to say at at face value, or just be called bigots and hate mongers. And now the culture pretty much says, we don't care about you and your Bible and your God and your laws. We're going to do whatever we want to. Your Bible is oppressive. Your God is oppressive. You know what the definition of oppressive is? Here's what the uh, New American Oxford Dictionary has. Oppressive. Unjustly inflicting hardship and constraint, especially on a minority or other subordinate group. Unjustly inflicting hardship or constraint. There is... A very good reason why the, why the LGBT, PDQ, box, why this group, this agenda has positioned themselves as minorities. Because if you're just going against the system, going against the rules, that's, a, that's rebellion. But if you can position your rebellion as we are unjustly being treated, we're a, a minority group, suddenly it's not rebellion It's oppression. If you go back and read our our, uh, founding fathers and the the reasoning given for leaving England and under King George, you hear this kind of language a lot. Not the minority, well, sort of the minority, but we're being oppressed. Now, I'm not equating that with what's going on. I'm just saying that's why there's there's a debate that rages. Was it right for America to revolt? Biblically, do we have a right to revolt? Is oppression itself just cause for revolt? I'm not going to get into that. I'm just stating the the arguments. But if if the community or any community can position themselves as minorities, then any laws and, and constraints is, by definition, oppression. Well, what does that mean for us? We're saying that God does not allow men to marry men. Or men to choose to be women. Well, that's oppressive because these minority groups are now being unjustly constrained. As Christians, our response, our position has to be clear God cannot ever be unjust. We don't need to get into arguments and debates about this. God is not unjust, ever. God is God. And God has the right, as God, to make whatever rules he wants to for his creatures. What creature is ever going to stand before God and rightfully say, you can't do that, God? Go ahead and try. I don't think you're going to get very far. 
God is God. God has the right as the creator, as the ruler of the universe. God has the right to determine anything he wants to. And he can never do anything unjustly. Because justice is defined by God himself. There's no standard outside of God that God has to conform to. Righteousness is determined by who God is and what he decides. As Christians, when people want to say this is oppressive, this is unjust, we have to say, in terms of these things, sexual preferences, sexual behavior, transgenderism, all that stuff, in terms of these things, what God has said is the only acceptable behavior. And it's not unjust for him to set the rules. He's God. And we don't need to get caught up in the debate about these things. That just plays into the enemy's hands. Our position has to be clear. God is God. It's not a popular position. It's not going to win you friends and influence people. It's not going to make you the most popular guy on your block or gal, your job. But it's the truth. God's laws are not oppressive. Sort of side note. One form of argumentation, one line of argumentation I hear quite a bit in, in this arena is that the, the argument where Christians, well-meaning Christians, and some of you probably use this, I don't want to step on your toes, I just want to get you to think about this. The argument is often we come to uh, maybe two men that are wanting to be in a relationship, and, and we want to say to them, I know you don't understand this, but God wants your best. And exclusive, heterosexual, monogamous marriage, that is for your best. That is the best thing. Do you realize the scripture never argues that way, ever? The scripture never says this is why God set it up this way, because this is what is best for you. And if you go down this other path, it's not, you're not going to be as fulfilled because it's not what God's best is for you. Scripture never argues that way. The scripture says, Jesus is Lord, and these are my commandments. And the reason you should obey them is because I'm your king, and I'm telling you to. Now, do I think it's true that it is our best? Sure. But we've got to be careful because going down that path can suddenly slide into soft pedaling where we're now ashamed or embarrassed to say, this is wrong because Jesus said it's wrong. Don't argue that way. Just argue from the scripture, this is what God says, this is what is right. Then there's the second issue, which is that we can do whatever we want and there aren't any consequences. There are consequences. There are bitter consequences. There are harsh consequences. You shall not die, Eve. You shall not die. Guess what? She died. He was wrong. Three consequences. Three consequences for her actions. Number one, verse 16, God says to the woman, to Eve, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Right here at the core of her womanhood, this thing that makes her unique, I know this is going to come as a surprise to you, but I will never give birth to a baby. Never, ever, 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 ever will I have that experience. I'm not equipped. God didn't give that right and privilege and joy to men. It's unique to women to carry within her own being a new life. What a joy, what a fantastic 
blessing and gift. And right there in the core of her womanhood, God judges her because of her disobedience. You will still give birth, Eve. You will still be able to have children, but it is going to hurt like crazy. And all you women who curse your husbands in the delivery room, you get it wrong. Curse Eve. It's not his fault, it's her fault. Right before you're glorified, when you get there, slap her, okay? Because when you're glorified, you won't want to anymore. Right there in how God made her unique as a woman, the punishment comes, the consequences come. And I would imagine most of you mothers in here would amen the fact that that's a pretty hefty price. Before the joy, now there's suffering because of sin. There are consequences. The end of verse 16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now there's going to be strife. Now there's going to be fight between the man and the woman. When it says, your desire will be for your husband, what I believe he's getting at is, now she is no longer going to be willing to be his helper. Now she wants to be the authority. Now she wants to be in charge. We'll look at this next week, how God designed it for man to be the primary gardener and the woman to come alongside and help. She refuses, because of this, to be satisfied as the, as the woman, as the helper. She wants his place of authority. And what's the man's response? He does not so quickly give this up. He now is going to rule over you, it says. That doesn't mean just in, a, in an abstract, authoritative sense. It means he is now going to assert his authority. So what we have seen throughout the history of civilization is this back and forth swing of the pendulum from male dominance... To feminism. Back to male dominance, back to feminism where we are today. This fight has raged since Genesis 3.17, where men are overbearing and harsh and browbeating to women, and eventually women come out from underneath that, and they say, no, we're going to be in charge, and they squash the men, and then something happens where it goes back the other way. Back and forth, back and forth, and neither of them, neither of those are extremes, are the way God intended to be. Every time there are fights and battles and strife between men and women, husbands and wives, it is because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. When the world doesn't work as it should and the relations between men and women don't work as they should. It goes back to the fact that we are suffering the consequences of Adam and Eve. And so we get to a day like today where men are afraid to be men, as God would have us be. We'll talk about that more next week. And then the third consequence, despite what the snake said, she died. She shared the fruit with Adam. Adam, who was supposed to be her protector, was standing over there watching this interaction between her and the snake. Hello? Maybe that was an everyday occurrence for the snake to just crawl up, walk up, talk to his wife. I always say if she'd have just eaten the snake instead of the apple, we wouldn't be in this mess. Adam just stands by and watches her disobey God. He was the one who heard from the mouth of God himself, on the day you eat of it, you shall die. And he just stands over in the corner and watches this whole thing take place. And then she brings him the food and he says, oh, great, I'll have a bite. And God says, you came from dust, to dust you will return. You will die. The serpent was wrong. 
the deceiver lied to you. And their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren all the way down to you and me thousands of years later are suffering the consequences of their disobedience. And you and I are going to die. But there aren't consequences to sin, right? We do whatever we want to. We're in charge. We're captains of our own ship. Yeah, no, we're not. Now, this would be desperate and hopeless if the Bible ended at Genesis 3. But actually, even in Genesis 3, there's a little different song starting in the background. Someday there will be a child of that woman who will crush that snake. There would be another Adam, better than the first. Another Adam who would also be tempted by the snake. Satan led him out, so the Spirit led Jesus out to the wilderness to be tempted. He, first of all, didn't eat for 40 days. How many of you have ever gone on a 40-day fast? Have you ever gone on a 40-minute fast? 40 day fast. He doesn't eat for 40 days. He's a human being. Don't forget, he didn't get any special God juice. He's a human being who doesn't eat for 40 days. And he's weak, and his body is weak, and he's starving. And Satan shows up and says, You know, you have the power, just turn that rock into bread and eat something. He tempted him in every way that we are. He tempted Jesus to turn away from God and serve Satan. And each and every time, Jesus said, it is written. God has said. And he withstood the temptation. Not a single time did he give in. And he now is our representative. And there's hope because that innocent human being, that man who never disobeyed God, who never gave in to the deceiver, that man went to the cross and suffered as though he were you and me. Perfectly righteous, God treated him like he was you so that he can treat us like we were him, innocent and righteous. And that's our hope. That's the gospel message. The snake loses. He can make war against us, and he can harm us, and he can hurt us, and he can bring great trial and suffering and pain, but he loses because all death does is send us into the presence of Jesus. What about today? There are consequences to the sins of our culture. The whole world is confused. The whole world is deceived. The whole world is perverted. And there are consequences. There are consequences because God is still God, and God still hates sin, and God will still punish sin. That didn't stop in the garden. So our job as Christians is not to downplay sin, not to minimize sin, not to look the other way and say, you know, you're not going to be as happy as you would be otherwise. If you did it God's way, you'd be much happier. That's not our job. Our job is to call a deceived people to the truth, to show them what is real, To show them the trickery and the lies and the deception of their enemy. We have to tell the people of our culture there are two ways to live. There are two paths to go down. You can go down the path of the snake. 
And here's what will happen. You will experience some temporary pleasure. Sin feels good. We like it or we wouldn't do it. Let's not kid ourselves. Sexual sin feels good or people wouldn't be doing it. Realize that Eve did not reach for the fruit until she saw, hey, this is good. This is going to benefit me. This is going to make me wise. That's going to taste good. She didn't even think about it until she realized, hey, I'll get something out of this. So as our culture pursues these things, they're going to enjoy some form of temporal gratification. And the enemy, the deceiver, is telling them, this is all there is. Get it while you can. And don't ever, ever, ever let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. And we need to tell them, here are the consequences of going down that path. You will die, and after death, you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be condemned for your disobedience. And can I say this lovingly but firmly? If we are not willing to tell people that, we should stop calling ourselves Christians. Because that's the good news. The good news is that you can be saved from your sin. The good news is not that you can live some kind of a prosperous, happy life. That's the good news of the false apostles. The real apostles said this is the good news, that we have to call men and women, boys and girls, to repentance from their sin and faith in Jesus Christ and serve him. Otherwise, they will suffer what they deserve at the hand of a righteous and holy God. And if we're afraid to tell people that, let's stop calling ourselves Christians. Call ourselves Americans. You might be an American if, right? So that's one path. The other path is the path that says, I will serve Jesus. I will follow Jesus. I will love Jesus. And you know what? If we choose that, as most of you have, maybe all of you have, I don't know everybody here, on this path, we will have to say no to our own desires in some cases. We will have to say, no, I'm not going to indulge that interest. I'm not going to allow myself that happy pleasure. Because I love Jesus more than I love life. And he said, don't do that. So I'm not going to do that. We're going to have to say no to some things, and we're going to have to ignore some things and run from some temptations. But if we do that, and we persevere to the end, the scripture says there is waiting for us an experience, a satisfaction, a pleasure that is absolutely incomparable to anything we could possibly experience here on this earth. In fact, all of the pleasures we have on this earth are intended just to be little glimpses, little foretastes of what it's going to be like for eternity with Christ. To sort of paraphrase and distort one of C.S. Lewis's great statements, we are here simply playing in a giant mud puddle. But someday we're going to swim with the dolphins in the ocean. And there will be no killer whales, or they'll be tamed. Someday, if we will follow Christ and not follow the deceiver, everything your heart longs for, every joy and pleasure you desire, you will receive times a billion over. Those are the only two paths. Everybody's on one path or the other. We are either following the deceiver or we're following Christ. Those are the only two options. And as our world plunges headlong into these issues, if we are going to honor our Lord faithfully and accurately, we are not going to compromise. We're not going to give an inch. We are not going to be ashamed to say, that is sin that displeases Jesus. That is offensive to Christ, and if you don't repent of that, someday you will stand before him and give an account and be judged. 
but we will do it lovingly and gently and peacefully and graciously saying, I too have sinned against him. I too deserve his wrath, but I believe the story of his death and resurrection. And he said, if you believe the story of his death and resurrection, he will forgive all of your sins. And he'll give you the power to overcome temptations that come. Front Range Alliance Church, that is where we must stand. True to the scripture. Not swayed by the culture, not afraid of the culture, not afraid of what they're going to call us, what they're going to say to us. The financial detriments. We're, one of these days, we're probably going to lose our nonprofit status. My taxes will go up more than yours. I've already preached sermons. I'm going to preach more that will get me thrown in jail someday, probably. And I don't say that lightly. I don't want to go to jail. It's coming. But if we love Jesus, if we're committed to following Christ above all else, we will stand firm and not listen to the snake, but listen to this Savior. Let's pray. Father, there's a heaviness to this message. As the speaker, I feel it, and I'm sure as a hearer, it's there. And there should be, Father. These are no light issues. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself right now that we will be uncompromising even as we seek to be kind that we will be gracious, but not the kind of grace that loses the truth. That we be like Jesus who came with grace and truth. That our goal will not to stand up and say, we are offended. We are against your decisions. That's not the purpose. That we will call people to recognize they live in a world that was created by somebody else, and somebody else reigns as king. And that we will invite them to be forgiven before they stand before him and suffer the consequences of their actions. Father, fill us with your spirit. Give us boldness and bravery and courage. Give us compassion and gentleness. Give us truth. Give us your spirit and everything we need. Father, may this church, Front Range Alliance Church, persevere to the end, no matter what that end is in this life, that we may live together in glory in the next. For we pray in Jesus' name.